So we're reading from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Lila, chapter 3. The chapter is entitled Lord Chaitanya at the house of Advaita Acharya. This is verse number 97 and 98. So 98 is on the board. So I'll read the previous verse. <clears throat> Translation. So Advaita Acharya is responding to uh, Lord Nityananda. Lord Nityananda has been offered some foodstuffs by Advaita Acharya. And uh, it was a huge feast cooked by his wife, Sachi Devi. And uh, he offered it to Lord Nityananda. First he offered it to Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya said, I am a sannyasi. I can't eat all this. Just give me a little simple vegetable. <laughs> but then... Lord Dwaita said, but you eat every day in Jagannath Puri 56 times. So for this, this is just a snack, <laughs> something like that. And then, now he offers it to Lord Nityananda. Lord Nityananda says, what is this? I've been fasting for three days and now I still have to fast. <laughs> so he picks up a piece of rice and throws it. A handful, actually, and it bounced. It bounced. Good rice. It bounced and it hit the leg of Advaita Charya. And when it did, he started to dance. It's an interesting pastime here. So then Advaita Charya responds, jokingly, My dear Nityananda, I have invited you and indeed I have received the results. You have no fixed caste or dynasty. By nature, you are a madman. Purport. The word Sahaja Pagala, by nature a madman, indicates that Nityananda Prabhu was transcendentally situated on the Paramahansa stage. Because he always remembered Radha and Krishna and their service, this was transcendental madness. Sri Advaita Acharya was pointing out this fact. Verse number 98. To make me a madman like yourself, you have thrown the remnants of food at me. You did not even fear to the fact that I'm a Brahmana. Purport. The word Apanari Sama indicate that Advaita Chari considered himself to belong to the smart Brahmanas, and he considered Nityananda to be on the stage with pure Vaishnavas. Lord Nityananda gave Advaita Chari his remnants to situate him on the same platform and make a pure unalloyed Vaishnava or Paramahansa. Advaita Acharya's statement indicates that a Paramahansa Vaishnava is sent transcendentally situated. A pure Vaishnava is not subject to the rules and regulations of the Smarta Brahmanas. That was the reason for Advaita Acharya stating, Apanada Samamori Karibhara Tade, to raise me to your own standard. A pure Vaishnava, or a person on the Paramahansa stage, accepts the remnants of food, Mahaprasadam, as spiritual. He does not consider it to be material or sense gratificatory. He accepts Mahaprasadam not as dal and rice, not as ordinary dal and rice, but as spiritual substance. To say nothing of the remnants of food left by a pure Vaishnava, Prashad is never polluted, even if it's touched by the mouth of a chandala. Indeed, it retains its spiritual value. Therefore, by eating or touching such Mahaprasadam, a Brahmana is not degraded. There is no question of being polluted by touching the remnants of such food. Actually, by eating such Mahaprasad, one is freed from all contaminations of material condition. That is the verdict of the Shastra. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Ginajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Visam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So there seems to be a little disagreement here going on. 
And uh, but between great personalities, I mean, Lord Nityananda is Sri, the supreme personality of Godhead Himself. He is Lord Balaram. Advaita Charya is Mahavishnu, and uh, Sada Shiva, the original Shiva, in one personality. So they're arguing, and it seems like they're just fighting like ordinary people. But actually, this is a very transcendental, joking and very intimate relationship between the two that is full of love. And sometimes it looks like there is an argument going on or a disagreement, but actually it's much more than what it appears to be. It's a lot more. It's actually a way to show loving exchanges between both of them. And so it says in the Shastras, if one hears this, uh, this message or this particular pastime and takes the side of one or the other, their spiritual life is doomed. <laughs> Very strong statement. That's, that's practically the exact statement. So what it means is that actually, although there appears to be a disagreement going on, and it looks like they're kind of angry at each other, it's actually transcendental. It's full of love, and it's full of a lot of joking. <laughs> Nityananda, he follows no rules and regulations. Therefore, he's called uh, Avadut. Avadut means one who's on the highest spiritual platform, follows no rules, follows no regulations. And as mentioned here, he's always absorbed in loving devotion to Radha and Krishna uh, 24 hours a day. <laughs> in fact, he cannot be otherwise. In other words... A person on that level of devotion cannot cannot not think of Krishna. <laughs> it's like one time someone said to Srila Prabhupada, it's very difficult to think of Krishna. Prabhupada said, difficult? No, very easy. <laughs> For Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada, he was absorbed in that consciousness all the time. And for him to think of Krishna was his natural consciousness. And that's the that's the consciousness of a great soul, and that's the whole process of devotional service to bring us to the stage of remembering Krishna always. And that is actually perfection in devotional service. And so here in this very interesting loving exchange between these two, they uh, they calling each other's names. <laughs> one is calling one a smart Brahmin, the other one calling the other one a madman. Uh, so from that point of view, it looks like they're uh, criticizing each other. But here, Advaita Charya, Prabhupada reveals in this particular purport that Nityananda wants Advaita Charya to come to his stage of devotion. Is he on that stage of devotion? He's the supreme personality of God in himself, Advaita. So is Lord. So is Lord Nityananda. They're both God. God is arguing with God. <laughs> So, who's right? <laughs> There's no question of right and wrong. It's just a transcendental exchange between two personalities who have appeared in this world in order to perform their pastimes for the pleasure of the devotees. And here, the point is that, and this is an interesting point, the idea of smarta brahmanas. What is a smarta brahmana? A smarta brahman means one who follows rules and regulations very carefully according to Vedic rituals and procedures for worship and for chanting mantras, but doesn't know the essence. We see that is called, uh, that is called, uh, yeah. well, it's called smartism, but it's really external bhakti. It's not real bhakti because it's external in the sense that one performs all the rules and regulations. Just like Prabhupada says, when you're worshiping the deity, and you're offering, if you don't understand that that deity is the actual supreme personality of Godhead, and you're offering these articles in devotion to him, then it's just ritual. That's all it is. It's just ritual. Or, if you see that deity as different from the deity that sits in the heart of all other living entities, that is like pouring ghee on ashes. In other words, pouring ghee on fire is yajna, it's agnihotra. 
But if it's just ashes and you're pouring ghee, what is, what is this? Just just ritual. That's all. It, actually, it looks quite ridiculous. <laughs> so, in the same way, if we don't see that in the hearts of all other living beings, that same deity that I'm worshiping every day, taking darshan from, praying to, is in the hearts of all other living entities, then that worship is actually like pouring ghee on ashes. It's ritual like that. So a smart Brahmin is one who knows the rituals very well. In fact, they're expert at the rituals, but they haven't really understood the, the essence. So Nityananda is calling Advaita a smart Brahmin. <laughs> and Advaita is saying, well, actually, because of your mercy, you're actually bringing me to a higher platform. So I actually I'm grateful for that. And here, one of the qualities of a smart Brahmin, it's nicely pointed out in here, is that they can't understand the nature of prasadam. <laughs> There's a nice discourse in the uh, in uh, Bhakti Vinoda course Jaiva Dharma between one smarta Brahman and a Vaishnava, and the and the Vaishnava is explaining that when foodstuffs is offered to the deity with devotion according to the rules and regulations that is given in the scriptures. And then, after that offering, that food is actually transcendental. It's no longer material, it's no longer just food. It's actually purified substance. And one who takes that food actually becomes, as Prabhupada, as Prabhupada mentions in the Purpura, free from all contaminations of material uh, existence. That's the power of Mahaprasadam. Sometimes we don't understand that principle. We receive Mahaprasadam every day and we th we look at it in terms of what it is. Is it rice? Is it dal? Is it sabji? Is it, is it mangalarti sweet? <laughs> and we have a... So one time, well not one time, but Prabhupada used to, every night when he would sit in his room, he would invite his disciples to come in for darshan. So Prabhupada would do that occasionally. And Prabhupada would breach some subject and just talk. And he would talk and talk, and then devotees would ask questions. It was a very intimate satsang. So at the end, they would bring Prabhupada a big plate of Mahaprasadam. And Prabhupada would look at it, he would take maybe an apple or pick out one or two things, and then he would say, okay, distribute it. So they would distribute the prasad. And then the person who was distributing would go around to the devotees, and the devotees would go, I want that one. I want that one. That's for me. You know. So Prabhupada started to notice that. So one night after he finished, he said, take it all and just mix it. Mix it all up. And then distribute it. So, you know, you put the sweet rice with the dal, and you just put it in. And he said, now you distribute it. He wanted to make a point that um, Mahaprasadam is absolute. <laughs> and to see it in terms of what it is, in terms of the different ways that it appears, it may reduce the actual co proper consciousness that the person has in accepting it and seeing it in terms of what it is rather than seeing it as being transcendental. It's like there's a story of... Um, Ramanujacharya. Ramanujacharya every day would come into one temple and he would take the charinamrita of the deity. So there was one envious, very envious uh, uh, pujari who didn't like Ramanujacharya. He was very envious. He was so envious that just by seeing Ramanujacharya he would become unhappy and upset. So he actually decided to do something very devious. He put poison just before Ramanujacharya was come in the in the uh, Charinamrita. So when Ra Ramanujacharya came and he was about to take the Charinamrita, he understood it's poison. And Krishna's in the heart, especially of a you know purified person. But he understood, well, it's actually Mahaprasadam. And not only that, it's the water that washes the lotus feet and lotus form of the Lord. So it's transcendental. So he took it anyway. Nothing happened. <laughs> because he was so transcendental. But he was he also, there's a nice point that, that actually 
However way Mahaprasadam appears, whether it's the form of Charinamrita or any form, it's actually purified. One devotee said to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, Prasadam is transcendental, and we hear that, you know, it is actually devotional service, so when we sit down, we don't eat Prasadam, we honor Prasadam. So we actually, the Goswamis used to offer their obeisances and also chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, why they would eat Prasadam. Because they know that they're accepting Krishna in the form of foodstuffs. So one devotee asked Prabhupada, is it possible that we can eat prasadam all day and then, you know, because that's, that's bhakti, you know, that's, can, we, can we have that service? <laughs> Prabhupada said, if you can see it as Krishna, then you can do that. <laughs> In other words, if you have that pure vision that this is Krishna and it's non-different, then you can eat as much as you want and you'll get purified. <laughs> But if you don't have that consciousness, don't try it. <laughs> and even if you do, you might be depriving somebody else. So. <laughs> so this is important to understand because prasadam is such an important, important, important part of our whole process. It's not just to satisfy the needs of the body or even the needs of the mind or the tongue. It's actually a way to become free of all material contamination. Therefore, it's one of the best forms of preaching when we distribute Mahaprasadam to others. Because many times, and sometimes we see, people are not inclined to Krishna consciousness, but they are inclined to eating. <laughs> and that's, that's a natural principle of existence. One has to eat. So when we offer these nice foodstuffs, some, one time I remember... Two people who were taking prasadam regularly, they were coming to our temple, they were saying, okay, what do you guys put in it? No, it's nothing. It's just it's just what it is. It's, you know, it's the ingredients with the spices cooked in this way. No, no, there's something magical in there. What is it? You know, because we never tasted anything like this. Well, we told them, yes, the magic is that it's been tasted by the Lord and therefore it's transformed. It's no longer the same. When it goes on the altar, it's one thing. When it comes off, it's completely different. Like that. And so, you know, prasadam is always in that mood of being, what we say, free from all material contamination. Another time, <clears throat> a person said, you know, you guys really make this nice food. Give me the recipe. So we gave him the recipe. I was at the temple, we gave him the recipe, cooked it, came back and said, it doesn't taste the same. <laughs> I said, you forgot one ingredient. <laughs> it's called Krishna's saliva. <laughs> and that's the main ingredient, and that makes it transcendental. So this this is very important to understand, that, that Maha Prashadam, or any Prashadam, and that's why it's so important that those who actually prepare prasadam are in the right consciousness. Because according to the consciousness of the cook, Krishna is eager or more eager to accept. And you can see, sometimes you see how prasadam is so amazingly good. But it's the same thing I've been eating all day, every day, but it's the same thing. It's because of the consciousness of the cook and Krishna becomes more and more eager to taste that. And then it becomes more and more, what we say, noticeably transcendental. <laughs> Notice. So prasadam is never ordinary and we should never see it. If it falls on the ground, if it's e it says it here, that even if it's touched by the mouth of a chandala, it, it can never lose its transcendental I remember in, when I was in New Vrindavan in the old days, <clears throat> we would uh, go to the Sunday feasts, and then many sometimes guests would come. So, uh, and then they wouldn't finish their, you know, prasadam plate. So sometimes devotees say, "Well, we can't touch this. This was touched by the, you know, the non-devotees." No, no. But there was a few devotees who knew the transcendental program, so they would take it and, you know. 
make good of it like that. So nothing can contaminate prasadam. Prasadam is always. But if you don't have that consciousness, just like if it falls in the dirt and you think, ah, well, I can't eat it because it's dirty. If you're on the transcendental platform, if, in other words, if you have pure consciousness, it won't affect you. But if you don't, it will. <laughs> it's a matter of consciousness. But, con but, the, but it is transcendental from the absolute point of view. And if we take it, therefore, when we honor prasadam and accept it in that mood that this is Krishna come in the form of foodstuffs, therefore, I'm actually worshiping Krishna by accepting these foodstuffs. That's why it says if someone offers you maha prasadam and you say no, that's an offense. <laughs> no matter what time it is, no matter whether you're hungry or not, it doesn't matter. If someone offers you a little maha, you have to accept some particle of that offering. Otherwise, one becomes, just like it's mentioned in the, the Shastra, when Lord Chaitanya converted Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya from a smarta brahmana into a Vaishnava, and then just after that, Lord Chaitanya came to the house of uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya early in the morning, and he had some maha from Lord Jagannath. He came into the room. Advaita uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was just waking up. Jai Sri Sri Radha Gokulananda Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman Gornitai Ki Jai. <clears throat> and upon seeing Lord Chaitanya, he offers his respects. He was just getting up. And you know, when the smarter brahmanas, they follow rules and regulations very carefully. So they won't do anything until they actually bathe. It's very, very strict. Therefore, they don't touch anything. But when Maha Prashadam came with Lord Chaitanya, after being converted by Lord Chaitanya, Advaita Charya immediately accepted the Maha. Immediately. And Lord Chaitanya said, Oh, how is that? You didn't even wash. How are you? You're, you're, you're accepting this prasadam without washing. Lord Chaitanya was just testing him. And Advaita, uh, I'm sorry, not Advaita, but uh, you know, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya said, My dear Lord, uh, this is Lord Jagana has come <laughs> personally. So then Lord Chaitanya became so happy. He said, now you have been converted. You have been fully understood. You have only fully understood. Now you are a Vaishnava. Before he was a rules and regulations person. We follow for rules and regulations when they actually lead to bhakti. When they lead, don't, when they lead away from bhakti, then rules and regulations can be, just like Prabhupada, someone said to Prabhupada, they were preaching in Russia. And um, there was nothing to eat in those days. This was in the early days when just when communism was still very strong in Russia. And devotees were preaching behind the Iron Curtain. So one devotee had messaged Prabhupada that, Prabhupada, there's nothing to eat here. All I can find is meat. Prabhupada said, eat meat, but preach. <laughs> he said, preach. So therefore, what was that? There was two principles. Either if I don't eat, I won't be able to preach, but if I eat meat, then I'm actually con committing a discretion on the Shastras. Prabhupada said, preaching is more important. But then he, then he said, but don't take advantage. <laughs> In other words, if you're preaching, there's no rules and regulations, but one should not take advantage of that and use that as an excuse not to follow or to act in, an, in another way like that. One has to follow very carefully here. So this this principle of understanding the absolute nature of anything that comes in contact with the Lord. Therefore, because Maha Prashadam is directly in contact with the Lord, it is transcendental. I remember back in 1996, maybe some of you remember this, there was a, a number of incidents around the world where when the pujaris were offering the milk on the altar the deities were drinking the milk so the cups were coming back empty this happened in 96 so this was a regular thing and then reports were becoming from different places 
So, not all the time, but there were many, many, many incidents. So I was sitting in my, I was sitting in the temple in Chicago, and some one man came in and he started to rave. Miracle! 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 God, he's eating! He's eating! He's drinking the milk! And I said to him, he does it every day. <laughs> But this time he's a, he's a little less kind. He didn't leave you any. <laughs> so he couldn't understand that. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, you know, patram pushram falam toyam yome bhakta panachiti taraham bhakta uparitam asnami. Asnami means ayi. Asnami payatat manaha. Like Krishna says, if you offer foodstuffs with love and devotion, Immediately I, I eat. But Prabhupada said he doesn't eat like you. Advaita Machuri Anari Anantarupa Adyam Purana Purusha Nava Yoga. Vedesha Durlava Atma Durlam Bhaktam Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bhajami. What is that verse from the from the Brahma Samratya that mentions the different limbs of the Lord? I can't remember the verse. But it says that all of the Lord's limbs are interchangeable. So he can eat with his eyes. He can walk with his ears. <laughs> In other words, he's not limited like us. He's transcendental. So all his senses can perform all the activities of all the other senses. So when we're offering something on the altar, and then we take it off and they think, oh, it's still there. It's not the same. <laughs> He's eaten it. Although from our vision we cannot see that. But that's the nature of transcendental uh, a transcendental body. It's not limited. Like us, we have to eat. Whatever. Prabhupada says, <laughs> Prabhupada's funny. He's, he's always making these little comments. He says, you know, don't try it with your wife. You look after your wife and you can make her pregnant simply by looking at her. <laughs> He says it doesn't work. <laughs> you might think you I can have transcendental senses too, I can it's interchangeable. <laughs> so the point is that uh, the nature of the absolute truth and anything in contact with it is actually holy or sanctified. Actually everything in existence is holy and sanctified. There's nothing that is not holy but there are things that are directly connected with Krishna in devotion, and they become Mahaprasad. But everything is sacred, actually. That's why it says, when you're walking on the ground, you're walking on Krishna, because the, the ground is actually the energy of Krishna, and the energy and the, ener and the energetic is non-different. So how can you walk when you're walking on Krishna? Isn't that an offense? So there are a class of spiritualists who have that understanding. But we understood that Krishna manifests himself in the form of his energy for the use of the conditioned living's entity in order they could use that energy to, to engage in devotional service and become purified. But from the absolute platform, there's nothing material. Material simply means cut off. So when you see something that is apparently separate from Krishna, you're seeing with material vision. And when you see everything that's connected with Krishna, you're seeing everything in the proper respect. Therefore, nothing is ever separated from Krishna. Nor are you ever separated from Krishna. Prabhupada says this cloud called the material energy is just the cloud over the spiritual sky. It has no real existence. So really, we have never left Krishna. We are always with Krishna 24-7. But because of that cloud of consciousness, we think we're separate. But it's an illusion. It's simply an illusion. So removing that illusion brings us to the right consciousness when we understand it. We're never, we're never left Krishna. We're always with Krishna. And everything that is in existence, both material and I mean, both spiritual and created, the created energy. The created energy is also spiritual in the sense that the basic principles of material energy can never be created. Earth, water, fire, ether, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego always remain eternal. 
They are created by Krishna himself, the ingredients that make up the material energy. Therefore, they're spiritual. Just like you can change the forms of anything material, but you can't break it down beyond its atomic structure. Therefore, in that atomic structure, it remains absolute or eternal. That's the nature of that. When we have that understanding, then we understand everything is sacred. And we treat everything in the right way. Therefore, a devotee sees everything in relationship to Krishna. And everything, and every person connected with Krishna, either directly or indirectly, either through their spiritual energy by worshipping, or through the material energy. Because material energy is also Krishna's energy. Therefore, one who is a materialist, who is serving the material energy, is actually connected to Krishna th through the material energy, or through his cut-off energy, but is not aware of that. And therefore, it looks like they are, what we say, acting against Krishna, but actually they're serving Krishna through the material energy. And there's the verse, yayatam mam prapadyante tam sataiba bhajami ham mam abartmana martante manusha parta sarva shaha. What is that verse? Is that the right one? 9-11? Yeah. I, that's the one, right? I think that's 9-11. Yeah, Krishna says, what is the translation? Um, everyone worships me. Some worship me directly and some worship me indirectly. So everyone is worshiping Krishna. That's why there's a person on the highest spiritual platform called the Uttama Adhikari or the Mahabhagavat. He sees everyone worshiping the Lord better than him. Even the materialists, he thinks the materialists are better devotees than he is because he sees himself as the lowest and he sees that they are worshipping Krishna through the material energy. Therefore, they are more advanced than I am. This is a very elevated consciousness and we shouldn't try to, what we say, superimpose that consciousness on ourselves and expect to act like that. Just like you might think, well, everything is Krishna, therefore I can't do anything because if I walk on the floor, I'm stepping on, you know. <laughs> so, therefore, we have to make this distinction between material and spiritual. But from the absolute platform, there is no distinction. There is no, no difference, therefore. And what does it mean in devotional service? We treat everything as Krishna's energy. And therefore, it is also sacred. What does that mean in practical terms? The devotee sees that this energy is meant to be used in the service of the Lord. And when we use whatever we can use in the service of the Lord, then that object becomes transcendental and our hearts become purified. And you can apply that to everything you do in life when you see everything in relationship to Krishna. Because there is nothing but Krishna. As Krishna, as it's mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam, one of the nutshell verses, before the creation, it is I that exist. During the manifestation, it is I that exist. And after the annihilation, it is I that remains. Krishna speaks that directly. So there's nothing but Krishna. Therefore, Prabhupada, in one lecture, he said, you're Krishna, I'm Krishna, we're all Krishna. <laughs> but then somebody asked, Prabhupada, we're not Prabhupada. said, ah, yeah, I'm giving you the oneness of reality. But we have to make that distinction, oneness and difference, that things are, are Krishna and not Krishna at the same time. So when they're used in the service of the Lord, they become purified and transcendental. When they're not, they're cut off. They're still of the nature of Krishna's energy, but because they're cut off, they appear to be something different or separate material like that. This is very important to understand. And that way, everything we can treat everything in the right way. Therefore, Prabhupada never used to waste anything. When he would be walking and he'd see a faucet from someone's house dripping, he would tell his devotee, Shut that off. They're wasting Krishna's energy. Someone would leave a light on in the room and would nobody be there. Prabhupada said, shut that light off. Or in India, you know, the fans. Prabhupada said, go out of the room, shut the fan. 
You're wasting Krishna's energy. So he saw everything as being the energy of Krishna and has to be used in Krishna, not wasted like that. There's one pastime where Prabhupada was in Vrindavan. And he was with his devotees and they were on the morning walk. It was early in the morning. So they were walking around the Krishna Balaram temple. They were following the same path. So Prabhupada would be walking, and when they got to one spot, Prabhupada would say, they see, but they do not see. And then he would walk on, and the devotees were thinking, wow, what is Prabhupada seeing? Wow. He has vision, we can't see it. So then he'd go on again, and he'd come around, and he got to the same spot again. He said, they see, but they do not see. And then devotees got more excited. What is Prabhupada seeing? Finally, the third time he came around, and he said it again, same place. Prabhupada said, they see, but they don't. Prabhupada, what do you see that we don't see? It's morning, it's light out, and that light is still on. <laughs> <laughs> shut the light off <laughs> so that was Prabhupada he wanted you know to that we not waste Krishna's energy made it a little bit mystical in the way he did it <laughs> so yeah when we have that understanding and if you never waste any of Krishna's ever energy you'll never be in want when you waste something you have a tendency to be in want of something if you never waste anything, you'll never in want. Krishna will always make sure you have what you need and more. When you take care of even the little things, that's why it says the little things lead to the big things. If we're negligent in small things, then we can't really be in a proper consciousness when it comes to doing regular devotional service. Everything becomes important. Okay, so any questions or... Comments on...